Hello, and welcome to the Indie Author Podcast. Today, my guest is Dharma Kelleher. Hey, Dharma, how are you doing? Doing well, and yourself? I'm doing great, thank you. Good. To give our listeners and viewers a little bit of background on you, Dharma Kelleher is a trailblazer in the crime fiction world known for her thrilling stories that are equal part, heart-pumping action, and thought-provoking social commentary. As one of the few openly transgender authors in her genre, Dharma tackles tough issues and shines a light on the underrepresented and marginalized. And we are going to be tapping into Dharma's representation of the underrepresented marginalized because today we're going to be talking about perspectives for listeners who are members of the LGBTQIA plus community and feeling discouraged about connecting with an audience. Also advice for listeners who want to include those characters in their stories, including trans tropes to avoid. And then we're also going to be talking about sensitivity readers, both using one and being one. But let's just start out. Dharma, can you go through the acronym and remind us of what those letters uh, represent? Okay, let's see. L is lesbian. G is gay. Generally referring to gay men. B is bisexual. Also applies to pansexual. Then there's the T, which is transgender. The I is intersex. Um, And A is asexual. And then the plus is all the rest of us that don't fit into the normal straight cisgender world. Great, thank you. So I thought it would be interesting just to start out talking about what do you see? So there's the writing side of it, the writing craft, and I think we'll get to that a little bit when we're talking about sensitivity readers. But I actually wanted to start out with the publishing side and ask you, what do you think is unique for LGBTQIA plus authors when it comes to finding and reaching their audience? Well, a lot of people will see our books and they'll think, well, I'm not gay or lesbian or trans or whatever, and they'll think, oh, that book's not for me. Even though the the, a story is a story, and one of the beautiful things about literature is we get to explore different worlds other than our own. So, I mean, I read stories about private investigators. I'm not a private investigator. (laughs) I read stories from a variety of racial perspectives. Mia Manansala, uh, she writes from a Filipino-American perspective. Kelly Garrett writes from a Black American or African-American perspective. And I mean, I don't have to be Black to understand or appreciate the story and get immersed in the excitement in the story. And I also often learn a little uh, as well, you know, that's the joy of reading, you know. (laughs) People have a tendency to think, oh, well, that's, that's, not for me because I'm not gay. I'm not trans. Or I write crime thrillers. I write crime thrillers that they focus on the crime that they're told from a trans perspective, but you don't have to be trans to appreciate it. There might be some inside jokes that I might include there that someone outside the community not, might not understand, just as there are subtleties, like if I'm reading something by S.A. Cosby or Gabino Iglesias or something that there may be layers in their stories that I might not quite pick up because I'm not from that community. But still, I can still enjoy the story. I can still root for the hero and enjoy it, you know? (laughs) So do you have two different marketing approaches? Do you have a marketing approach for the people who are within uh, the the L? G- I, ETQIA I, so, community and then those outside that you want to convince of that perspective that you just shared? I struggled with that for a long time. And I was like, do I need to have two marketing? I basically, my, my tagline is I write crime thrillers where queer women kick ass. And so it, it tells people the, the genre, the subgenre, they're action filled, they're gritty and, and they're from a queer women's perspective. And because not all of my books are from a trans woman perspective, my first series is from a a cisgender lesbian perspective. And so I just, that's my tagline. And that's basically how I market it. Sometimes I mention in the book description that the character is trans, if it fits in the book description itself. But I don't always, and people are going to either like it or not. I mean, I've got fans that are not trans, And they love my books just because they love the stories and they love seeing things from my perspective. And I was like, oh, I never knew that about, I never thought about how that, this situation impacts the trans community. 
And that coming out isn't just a one-time thing. It's a continuous lifetime thing, you know? <laughs> People, you know, it's like, oh, I never thought about it that way. It's like, yes. And so, but you know, my, that my stories are about trans issues. They're about the crime and solving the crime or figuring out, avenging the crime or whatever it is. And so I, I don't have a separate marketing strategy for the two different communities. I just put it out there and hope that the people who will enjoy it will find it. That comment about you don't come out once you come out, right? You know, it's a continuous yeah. process. Exactly. What you said, the phrase you use is interesting because I can imagine there are lots of circumstances other than coming out that that applies to. If you think of it in a more general literary thematic thing, yeah, that anyone who's reading that might read that and say, oh, that's like the situation I'm facing where I have to deal with the same issues of acceptance or community right, yeah. over and over again. When you're writing, do you do you think about those things explicitly and try to generalize it in that way? Or do you kind of leave it to the reader to make those generalizations? If I leave it to the reader. I respect the reader's intelligence that they can make the comparisons. Maybe there's someone that deals with a chronic medical situation that they're constantly having to explain. It's not a situation that's obvious when people meet them. And then they have to explain, well, no, I, I have this that I have to deal with on a daily basis. And, and it can be tiring sometimes. <laughs> and so they can say, yeah, I can relate to that. I mean, I don't have to come out, but I have to explain to people that this is what I have to live with, chronic pain or fibromyalgia or whatever the situation is. So yeah, and that's the beauty of literature is we can find our commonalities amongst our differences. We can say, oh, okay. I don't know what it's like to be Asian American, but I can appreciate this aspect of their experience. Even if I haven't actually had that experience, I can appreciate it by comparing it to similar experiences that I've had. So um, it's, we can find our commonalities that way. So if there are listeners, and I'm sure this is going to apply to practically all of us, if there are listeners who are feeling discouraged about connecting with whatever audience they're trying to reach. And we can start talking about it from the LGBT yeah. perspective. Do you have any advice for them on how to get through that publishing frustration? Well, at first, the publishing side, what my first two books were published traditionally through Alibi, which is a imprint of Penguin Random House. And um, when my agent was pitching to the different publishers, one of the things we kept getting back was we really like it, but we don't know how to market it. And it's a crime. It was a crime thriller about an ex-con lesbian that's kind of trying to live the straight life, so to speak, as far as no longer being a criminal anymore. And yet situations keep pulling her back into it. And it's just, it's biker crime thriller kind of stuff. And, um, uh, we kept getting is that like, we don't know how to market it. It's like, it's a crime thriller. Why do you not know it? And we basically concluded what they were saying is, well, if your character was straight and a man, then we would know how to market it, but we don't know how to reach lesbians. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've been around for a while. When uh, was that? When did oh, that happen? This was back, it, the first one was published 2016. Okay. I think so. Yeah. I mean, about seven years ago. And do you think that that's changed at all? Do you have contacts in that world that make um, you believe whether it's changing or not? I I don't know. I think it's changing a little bit. There are two openly trans authors that, I'd say Robin Geigel, she's being published by, I think it's Kensington, which is not one of the big five, but they're a major press and the major small press, whatever you call it. And I think there's another author that's got a new book that they're her day, their debut. I don't know what their pronouns are. Their debut novel is coming out in a few months. And that's also from Kensington. So. At least one publisher is starting to publish trans fiction. And I think Renee James had a, some of her books published by either small press or traditional publisher. I think it's improving a little bit. I made the decision to go indie after my first two books because I went from writing about a lesbian outlaw biker to writing about a trans bounty hunter. And I figured if I was getting a, that much pushback about a, a lesbian cisgender character, I was going to get even more, it would just be impossible to get a publishing deal with a traditional publisher about a trans bounty hunter. So I went indie. I like being indie. It's a lot of work because I'm 
doing a lot of project management and everything. I'm my own publisher, so I get all the responsibilities of a publisher, all the costs of a publisher. And I take those responsibilities very seriously because I want to put out a professional product. I'm not just like throwing out a rough draft and then putting it up on KDP or anything like that. I go through rounds of editing with a professional editor. I do my own covers now, but I've got the skills to do it. I've got a background in graphic design. And so, yeah, I'm hopeful that it will get better, but the old ways are very still much in, entrenched. Yeah. I did want to ask a quick question that triggered, which is that, did you factor in your editor's experience? How specific to your area of topic did you look for an editor with expertise in? As, as long as they're good with writing uh, crime thrillers or editing crime thrillers, that's all I really care about. The trans experience... I can handle that and I can push back as needed. One of the things I sometimes have to push back with some of my, with my editors, they have a tendency to want to uh, italicize non-English words, which in the multilingual author community, there's been a lot of pushback uh, against that as othering. So I no longer italicize, like if I have a character and she speaks a line of Spanish or something, I don't italicize that. It's just, I just write. Write it is, yeah. write it as is, and then if if I think it's necessary, I might put a little bit of translation or explanation of what was being said, but I just usually just let it stand, or I have characters that will speak Spanglish, which is just, it's English with a little peppered with Spanish, and usually with profanity in Spanish or something like that, and I just leave it as is, and I won't italicize it, and then the editor's are like, okay, italicize, like, nope. <laughs> So there's some give and take, but yeah. as long as I understand how to edit crime throws, and mostly it's line editing, it's proofreading, I no longer feel the need for a developmental editor. So so I kind of, I had uh, taken you into a different route there by asking you the questions about traditional That's publishers okay. and editors, okay. but any other thoughts about uh, people who are feeling frustrated by trying to reach the audience that they want to reach? Um, well, it is frustrating. It's super frustrating. I mean, as an indie author, I don't get nominated for awards. <laughs> and I'm an indie author because I'm a trans author, because I felt that was the best way. And it's frustrating. But now I think you can get nominated for an International Thriller Writers Award. Did you read yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, theoretically, I can. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. No, it doesn't happen. And it's not about like, oh, nobody loves me or anything like that. But it is frustrating. Like every year, it's like, okay. Tell me your books that are eligible, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I wish everybody well, good luck. And But I realize it's never going to happen for me, and it's okay. To authors that are LGBT that aren't getting the love that they would like, remember why you're doing this. You're not doing this for the money. I mean, there are easier ways to make money. Honestly, there are easier ways to make money. <laughs> That's why I still have a day job. Yeah, I do this for the love because I love telling stories. I love telling crime thriller stories. I get to kill people off on the page and I don't have to go to jail for it. I get to research really weird things and not have to worry about the FBI listening in on my calls or checking my browser history. You have um, the best excuse. You're a thriller. Exactly. Right? It's like, hey, it's okay. I'm not a serial killer. I'm an author. I'm not a terrorist. <laughs> but And I do it to give trans people a hero to cheer for that's like them. Uh, at least in being trans. And I give, I do it to help non-trans people see the world a little bit from our perspective. In Red Market, I deal with a little bit of this onslaught of laws targeting trans youth, including laws criminalizing gender affirming care, which is, it's just truly terrifying. And I bring this up in, in this book and I hope to bring it home in a way that non-trans people that have no experience with trans people can appreciate the terror that we have to face on a daily basis. And that's why I do it. So if you're frustrated about not getting the the sales or the advances or the recognition that you would like, I hear you, I feel you, but remember why we do this. And no one's making you do this. That's the thing. No one is making you do this. So remember why you do this. And you can always stop if this isn't a good fit for you. Do you rely on outreach like, I'm thinking social media, because I can imagine that someone who's the person who reads, you know, a uh, kick-ass queer <laughs> protagonist, 
might say, okay, that's not for me because that, that I'm not relating to that. But if they encountered you on social media and interacted with you there, or at least saw your feed, saw your posts, that they might be won over to say, oh, I see, like, this person is interesting for other reasons. I'm not feeling like this difference. I'm yeah. more interested than I am feeling a difference. Do you use social media or other outreach in that way to kind of bridge that gap? I do. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out a marketing plan that works. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, I'm on Facebook. I used to be on Twitter. I'm not there any longer. I'm on Spoutable, some, somewhat on Instagram. I don't know how much interest it generates. I, it's hard to tell. But I think what being on social media does is it helps get my name out there to some extent. And it helps people to see the issues that are, that we're experiencing. So, yeah. So I want to turn, we've been talking a little bit about the publishing side. I want to talk a little bit about the writing side. Okay. And so I think one very valuable thing we can discuss is what are tropes uh -huh. for LGBTQIA plus uh -huh. that people should be watching out for if they want to include those characters in their stories, but they want to avoid the tropes um, or the cliches. As far, yeah. As far as trans tropes, because those are the ones that really hit home to me, there are a few. One is you've got the token trans character, okay, that's fine. And you make her a sex worker, which yes, there are trans sex workers, but this is the trope that comes up every time. I saw this in a book that went really viral by a friend of mine recently. And I was like, oh, this is a trans character, great. And she's a sex worker, of course. Or she's the murder victim. Or that's another one is like tragic murder victim. And yes, Murder of trans women is a very serious issue. We're murdered at hi much higher rates than just about any other uh, marginalized group. That is a serious issue. But it, I want characters with agency. I want characters that are something other than just sex workers, because I've known tens of thousands of trans people in my lifetime in the 30 years since I came out. And we are doctors and lawyers and accountants and IT people and programmers and designers and artists and every every profession you could imagine. And yet the one trope that keeps coming up is the sex worker. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with being a sex worker if, that, if that's where you are. But we are more than this. It's like the trope of the black housekeeper or have a little diversity in your diversity. Yeah. <laughs> and an, another trope, and I've seen this with she who shall not be named, the trans character as the murderer, the killer. And this was an issue in a lot of like 80s movies, like Silence of the Lamb. And there are people that, oh, well, the Buffalo Bill wasn't trans. He was just crazy or whatever. But there's this association with us. And the recent books by this other author that portray trans people as somehow violent, psychopaths, a threat to women, blah, blah, blah. And it's not the case. I mean, are there trans people that commit crimes? Sure. Just as if there are non-trans people that commit crimes. In fact, I would posit that we're less likely to commit crimes because we know how that much scarier it is if we have to go to prison. So, yeah, <laughs> so. it's interesting that it's almost like if you fast forward five or 10 or 20 or 100 years or however long we'd have to fast forward, then I'm assuming there would be no intrinsic problem with showing a trans character as a serial killer, because you would hope at that point there would be a representative. Like, I guess the concern is that it's not representative of the it's general not. population. And in, until other characters are coming into s fictional stories in roles that are more representative right. yeah, of exactly. the general just, population, then it then yeah. it's more uncomfortable. And there is there is a scene in one of my one of my books. It's just one scene where there is a character who commits a murder, a, a trans character, and I'm wanting to bring this character back to explore her backstory a little bit more, but it's. By far the exception. I mean, <laughs> and there's a great documentary that talks about the representation of trans characters in movies called Disclosure. I can't remember. I don't know if it's on Netflix or HBO or one of the streaming services, but it really gives a good in-depth history of trans women as we're portrayed on film and in 
TV shows, and explains not only the problems of the pro- tropes, but the history of it, why it was, it's a problem, and how it affects us. Because the real problem isn't just that, oh, I'm offended that this character is portrayed this way. The problem is that we are facing an onslaught of laws that portray us as a threat to women and children when we're anything but. We're just trying to live our lives, you know? Trying to pay our bills and have jobs and love our families and that's it. I think that the harm of portraying a marginalized character as dangerous is definitely clear. And I also liked what you said before about the agency because portraying them merely as like a a tool to achieve right. some plot yeah. end is mm-hmm. is in a way just as damaging. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, and I try to do this with other minority characters in my stories. I take a lot of time to say, okay, this character, if I make a villain or an antagonist, like some other type of ri- minority, a racial minority or something, I'm like, am I falling into, am I reinforcing negative stereotypes? How else am I representing members of that background in my story? Is this the token character? Am I portraying all of these characters in the same negative way? And this is something that we have to take time to give some thought to. And yes, it's one more thing we have to think about, one more issue that we have to address. But if we don't address it before we hit publish, we're going to have to address it after we hit publish because if it gets picked up and goes viral, it may go viral in the worst possible way and suddenly we're villainized because we didn't take the time to think about what we were doing. And by giving characters agency, we're showing that these people have lives, they have choices, they're not just tokens, they're not just pawns, they're not just using to fulfill the needs of the great white American hero. (laughs) And so it's important to take time. uh, Any character that is outside your experience, take time to just think about how is this character portrayed and are you portraying other characters from the same background in other ways? Just a quick break from the interview. Are you getting value from the podcast? Please consider supporting it and all the work I do at the Indie Author by becoming a patron. To pledge a monthly contribution, go to patreon.com forward slash the Indie Author, or to make an occasional contribution, perhaps to indicate the value that a specific episode or resource provided to you on your creative voyage, scroll to the bottom of any page at theindieauthor.com and click buy me a coffee. And now back to the interview. So I think that's a great entree to the third thing we wanted to talk about, which was sensitivity readers. And let's start out talking about using a sensitivity reader. Can you just talk a little bit about what the role of a sensitivity reader is, how authors would find them? Um, it's it's a little tricky to, it can be difficult to find them, but I'll get into that. The role of a sensitivity reader isn't to point out things that are, the term sensitivity is like, oh, we're just little sensitive little snowflakes that don't want to get our feelings hurt. And, and that's not it at all. I prefer to look at us in the same way as if I'm giving a scene to a friend of mine who's a retired police officer. It's like, am I portraying this police officer character or this crime scene or the way it's handled correctly? I'm calling on their expertise to make sure that it feels authentic to the character's experience, uh, to the sensitivity reader or the expert reader's experience. Because I don't want people coming back and say, hey, this gun doesn't have a safety on it or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> and the same applies to people who have a marginalized experience outside of your own. So, I mean, I've had, I had someone recently come to me with a story and it was with a character and they were kind of conflating the concept of drag queens with a character being transgender. And then they were like, had some crazy mental illness or something like that. And they were conflating a lot of issues and the story was okay, but I had to push back and say, first of all, you're conflating a number of different issues. Drag queens generally are gay men with some exceptions. So gay men and uh, drag queens are performers. They generally don't dress in drag outside of their performance. It's a performance. And trans people, it's their life experience. This is who they are. This is their identity. It's not about a performance. Now, there are trans people that do 
performing drag shows, some people come up to the ranks in the drag scene and realize, oh, you know what? I really am trans. And they come out as trans. That does happen. And I've got a character in my story that that was her experience. But conflating the two can be a problem because, again, the onslaught of recent laws targeting drag queens, but they're really about the dangers of trans people. And also when you get into the whole mental illness thing, and that ties into the trope of trans people are crazy, they're scary, dangerous, and that's where the harm creates. So I push back and say, okay, this is the issues. You have to make the choice of yourself, but these are the concerns, and this is the possible harm that you can do. And especially in a time where I can point to actual laws saying, look, this is what's happening, and your story would further the damage that these laws are doing. Because uh, tropes become words and rhetoric and then actions and then laws and then death. I mean, it's a progression. And so we're trying to prevent that cascade of horror. I mean, if you've got only one trans character, you have to be aware of various issues. And so when I push back and say, what I try to do is offer suggestions of how to make this story work so that it's not causing harm. I'm not here to act as a traffic police officer and say, nope, can't do that. I'm happy for cisgender authors to write trans characters. And I'm happy to offer suggestions to help them do that in a way that is not harmful. So when I get a feedback from a police officer on, a, on how a crime scene is handled, they say, well, you know what? What would be another way to handle this is if this character did this and this other character did that, or the weapon was here, and, and this would make it a little bit more intriguing. So I actually try to help make the story better in addition to providing my expertise as someone with trans experience. Well, I like that distinction between the emotional connotations of sensitivity and more like subject matter expert. Right, exactly. Because I think the conversation we've been having has highlighted the benefits of having a sensitivity reader or a subject matter expert like that. But I think a possible danger is that when people speak to someone um, and then think that they understand the entire demographic based on that interaction with that one person, right. and it not only is inaccurate because no one person in a demographic is going to represent the entire demographic, but it's also right. sort of limiting from a creative point of view because you don't want to then leave your interaction with that reader and say, oh, well, now I guess I have to represent my character as the person I've been speaking to as a subject matter expert in the area. Can you speak to that a little bit? I think so. I think I understand the question. I mean, trans people are very diverse, just as people of all marginalized groups are very diverse. We have a wide variety of experiences. Some of us come out young, some of us come out when we're much older, some of us are born into very accepting families, some of us are kicked out onto the street when we're teenagers. And so we have a wide variety of experiences. Some of us deal with abuse and bullying. Some of us haven't. And the fact that I'm not just trans, I'm also white. I'm a woman, so I, I have to deal with a lot of the discrimination that other women deal with. So we're not monoliths. And so, and when I give speak as a give advice as a sensitivity reader i'm not i can't say that you get a gold star so you're immune from any criticism that may come your way you may still get pushback and it may be illegitimate it, it may some other trans reader may say you know what i don't like how this character was portrayed i don't feel like she had enough agency or he had enough or they had enough because especially when i came out 30 years ago i didn't understand that there were non-binary people I didn't, that just wasn't part of my experience. And now, then I learned, oh, um, in the past 10 years, oh, non-binary people. Okay. Yeah. I can deal with that. So I, ha I've had to evolve my understanding as a trans person in the community, as an elder in the community. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. There's room for you in our community. Absolutely. You're one of us. And so understanding that there are going to be a lot of perspectives. There is the, pushback against the one author. It was about the immigrant experience. American uh, Dirt. American Dirt, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And and there was a lot of pushback. And I think part of it was that she was writing the story centered 
around the character's identity and their immigrant experience. And then it later came out that, yes, the author does have Puerto Rican heritage as well, and it became a whole mess of things. <clears throat> There's no gold star that will make anyone immune. I mean, someone can come back and tell me my portrayal of a Latinx character or a Black character or any other minority character outside of my experience could have been better or was harmful. But the great thing about being indie author is I can change it. I can say, and I can acknowledge it's like, thank you for helping me to better understand the portrayal of this character. And I may even ask for more feedback and say, how can I better portray this character? And then I will change it. Because I've done, I've made changes to stories that have come out six, seven years ago. I mean, I'm not above doing that. But you could go back and remove, we had talked earlier about italicizing uh, non-English words. You could go back and make that change very easily. Exactly. It is. It's And if if I were traditionally published, I couldn't do that because then I have to talk to my publisher and they're like, we're not going to reprint all those books. We're not going to go back to the editor and re-edit those files and then re-upload them. We got other books that we're worrying about. Yeah, I can do that. (laughs) Well, I think that the example of American Dirt, and I kind of hate to, so to speak, dig up American Dirt again, but (laughs) I I I did do some reading about it when that came out because of some work that I was working on myself at the time. And I think that there were two things that struck me. There were many things that struck me, but here are two of them. One yeah. is that I think many people said that the author just got some of her facts wrong. And right. so that idea that she wasn't maybe doing the careful fact-checking, she and her editors right. weren't doing the careful fact-checking mm-hmm. she should have. And then some of that I blame on the publisher because I think that the way the publisher was framing her background was inaccurate. And she may have lied to the publisher about what her background was, but mm-hmm. the publisher should have had some responsibility for fact-checking too. And yeah. so I think that the publicity around that was implying more of a personal connection to the story than she actually had. Right. Whereas I think that if she had written the story and been open about, well, first of all, done her homework, and then second of all, been open about what her the extent of her experience was, I think that people would have, well, first of all, she would have sold many fewer books because right. that was like a no publicity is bad publicity from the point of view. I'm sure she sold more books than she would have otherwise. Right. But I think someone would have read it and said, Okay, well, if I'm reading this to truly understand the experience of characters like this, I probably shouldn't be reading this book because this woman has never gone through it. I'm going to go look for an author who has that experience and read that book. Uh, But yeah, that was that was quite a fest there for a while. Yeah, part of the pushback was not simply someone who is perceived as white um, and non-Latino or Latina as writing the experience of from a Mexican-American or Central American immigrant experience, but that so many people with that experience are not published. So it's a matter of representation. The people with that true experience don't get the love and attention and publicity that white authors get. Yeah. Or authors that are perceived as white get. And so there's the racism and colorism that is inherent in the traditional publishing arena. And I see that too, you know, I've seen a lot of cisgender authors get all this publicity and they're writing about trans characters and I'm the most prolific openly trans author in crime fiction and I get diddly. There are crime fiction magazines that won't even publish my anything about me because I'm independently published. Like, ooh, you're clearly not good enough to be traditionally published, though. I was like, well, I do feel like that's gradually changing. Like, it's clearly a benefit well, of the indie world that we can now take into our own hands, getting these stories out yeah. there. And there are certainly still barriers. I feel like, uh, and I had referred earlier to the fact that the international thriller writers just changed their criteria for membership because yes. before, better. you couldn't have, you couldn't be a debut author for international thriller writers because the requirement for indie authors was a certain number of books, a certain number of sales over a certain number of times. So there were just, it was a catch-22. Right. So I I also want to give out a thank you to Jerry Williams, who was a past guest on the podcast because I love Jerry as the indie author champion. I don't think that's her official title, but that's what she's doing at international thriller writers. I think this is a great podcast. Yeah. She does have a great podcast. 
but yeah, I do think that it hasn't reached parity, but I think it has made great progress. Yes, it it is. Yeah. So, I mean, it is what it is. We can speak our minds, we can shout, and hopefully things will continue to change in a positive direction. Yeah. And we have the responsibility of doing things like using sensitivity readers in order to make sure that our work is as good or better mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. what is being put out by the big publishers. I was really excited when Jody Bico co-authored with Jennifer Finney Boylan with their recent novel, Mad Honey, which is a crime thriller. And I really enjoyed the book. And so I think hopefully that will give us a little bit more recognition. Jennifer Boylan tends to write a little bit more literary. She's written some memoir. She's written a lot of a number of like more of the elevated genres. <laughs> Outside of my experience, she's a very talented author and a professor and everything. And uh, her teaming up with Jodi Picot is a very good matchup. And the book is very good. I enjoyed it thoroughly. And Jennifer, ha Jenny has written another crime fiction book as well. So I'm happy to include her amongst the openly trans crime fiction authors. So, but the fact that it came from a traditional publisher, she co-authored with a big name cisgender author, I think will help make some inroads as well. So the last question I wanted to ask you is if someone is listening to this and they feel like they have a good perspective on a demographic group that other authors might benefit having their perspective if they want to become either a subject matter expert or sensitivity reader. Mm -hmm. Do you have suggestions whether that is like starting within their own local author community or on a more widespread professional yeah, basis? There used to be a database and later went away of sensitivity readers or subject matter experts. And I just, when I'm looking for, because I've hired sensitivity readers myself, I was writing an intersex character in one of my books, and I wanted to make sure that I was portraying this character authentically. And so I just went on social media and said, I'm, uh, I'm an author, crime thriller author, and I'm writing about a trend or an intersex character, and I'm looking to connect with intersex people and get their perspective and have them read this story or at least this, these scenes that portray this character and make sure that, A, I'm portraying it accurately. And I hired more than one, by the way, because intersex is a whole arena. It is not a monolith of experiences. And so I wanted to get a variety of experiences on this. And I spent a few hundred dollars on this. I probably should have spent more because I was paying for other people's experiences and expertise. But yeah, that's what I did. As far as promoting myself as a sensitivity reader, I just, I don't do anything to promote myself as such. But anytime someone is asking, I see that someone is asking for that service, I will say, happy to do it. For book length manuscript, I'll charge $250. If it's a short story, I'll charge less. Uh, I try to be fair. I also have to be aware of my own time commitments because... <laughs> It's easy for, for me to get overcommitted, but so I think that's a fair price, and that's just kind of how I promote myself as such. Great. Well, Dharma, thank you so much. This has been Thanks. so interesting and thought-provoking, and please let the listeners and viewers know where they can go to find out more about you and everything you do online. You can find me. You can order my books, including signed print books, at dharmakelleher.com. I'm on Facebook. My page is Dharma Kelleher Books. Um, no longer on Twitter. I am on Spoutable. If you're one of the few people that are on that emerging social media site as Dharma Kelleher. And that's generally where you can find me. I've got an author page on Amazon. And my books are everywhere. They're Amazon, Kobo, Apple, everywhere. Very good. Dharma, thank you so much. This has been so interesting. Thank you so much for having me, Maddie.